Well, I saw several other coming, but I don't see them yet. Uh, it's good to be with you all tonight. Happy for another chance we have to study in the book of Matthew. And again, our lesson is going to begin at least in Matthew chapter 24. We've spent quite a few weeks looking in uh, detail at this chapter and the prophecies that are found there. And uh, we'll begin to look at some parables that the Lord taught to try to help people be prepared for his second coming uh, that begin at the end of chapter 24. Before we enter into our Bible class, we want to begin with the word of prayer. Bless Brother Bill to direct our minds. Amen. All right, we want to uh, look at uh, the final section here in chapter 24 about be ready for the Lord's coming. And Jesus has introduced the idea of the end of the heavens and the earth and uh, that uh, that day is unknown to men or to angels or even to the Son. It hadn't been uh, revealed. The Father has fixed that day. And in verse uh, 42 says, Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. So the exhortation about the fact that this day is coming suddenly and unexpectedly like the days of the flood. Uh, people will be um, sleeping in one bed and one will be taken and one will be left and grinding at the mill and one will be taken and one will be left. Uh, one will be in, two, two people will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. So you have to be ready for that day so that you're taken and not left to destruction on that last day. Uh, so... They're exhorted here, be on the alert, be watchful. You can see the word translated the New American Standard, alert. Literally, uh, it uh, means to watch uh, in a physical, you know, I guess a literal sense. But here it's used metaphorically to watch, give strict attention to, to be cautious, active, to take heed, lest through lack of care or attention or indolence, some destructive calamity suddenly overtake one. So the Lord's telling us you've got to stay mentally alert and be watching for the Lord to come back, living by faith, walking by faith, knowing that He could return at any moment. It'll keep you from being, uh, uh, being destroyed by inattention to your life and how you should be walking and uh, being lazy. It'll keep all of those things away. And the parables that Jesus tells deal with that, that that's how you wait. That's how you stay alert is you stay active doing the things that God wants you to do. So they don't know the day that the Lord will come. No signs are going to signal it's coming. And we've looked at a lot of signs about when the destruction of Jerusalem would come in the temple. But no such signs are given for us to uh, determine, well, the Lord's coming next week. I better get my act together. I, there's no such sign that you have to be ready every day. The Lord could come tonight uh, just as much as a thousand years from now. We don't know. We don't know when he's coming back. So you have to be ready and live a sanctified life every day. And isn't that uh, the safe thing for us to do? Is to live always watching. Uh, even if the Lord doesn't come back, what could happen? <laughs> we could die tonight, right? Well, one of the uh, Elijah's, uh, you know, his uh, baseball team that they have, one of the coaches died last night, just suddenly, unexpectedly, that, that coaches his team. I don't know if they'll have a team now or what they're going to do for next year, but you just don't know. Uh, unexpected, totally. And uh, so we don't any of us know what's going to happen. So if you're living your life waiting for the Lord every day, then you're going to be ready if that happens too, right, if you go to meet him. So spiritual, moral circumspection is to live uh, on the alert. You're watching your steps and looking for dangers in your life and temptations and trials, knowing that the devil's out to get us, right? And the world is out to influence us away from God. And so you're always on the lookout. You're alert and waiting for the Lord to come. So any time he could come. And the Lord says, but be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. So the Lord is coming and you're going to, uh, the world's going to be 
surprised when that day comes. I hope uh, we're looking for it and hastening that day and we'll be happy when it, we're surprised by it. It'll be a good day for us. But it's going to be unexpected when it happens. It's not going to be something you're going to know about ahead of time. Any more than a thief breaking into your house. Uh, any of us, I don't know if you had things stolen from you. I've had stuff, people break in my car and steal my stereo or my 8-track tapes. If you ever heard of such a thing as an 8-track tape back in high school. Uh, and it's a very bad feeling. You think, oh, wow, they just came in, you know, in the dead of night when I wasn't looking and I didn't lock things up or whatever and they took it. <clears throat> Lord's coming in the same way when you don't expect it. And that's repeated several times in the New Testament. The day of the Lord, that final day, is coming like a thief, we're told in Second Peter. And the Apostle Paul tells he doesn't need to write to the church at Thessalonica about you know, when the Lord's coming because we don't know when he's coming. He's coming like a thief. So it, it, there's nothing Paul could tell you except be ready all the time. Live as in the day all the time. Don't do your sleeping spiritually like people sleep at night or get drunk at night. Stay awake all the time. So houses, uh, it says here the man would have uh, kept the thief away if he knew when he was coming. He know, knew when somebody was going to show up and rob you, you could get your gun ready and you could sit in your, with the lights off and wait for them and run them off or whatever. But you can't do that when you don't know. You see, he says you've got to be alert. Uh, it says they break through and steal. We don't have people with brick, our brick houses or wood houses or whatever, dig through the wall usually to get in and steal stuff. But they had these uh, clay, made out of clay bricks and, and dirt and so on, their houses, and people literally could dig right through the side of your wall and get in and steal things. So that's a literal uh, idea there. And don't know the day nor the hour, so we, we can't get close. Um, Verses 45 and 46. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Now, we don't know when the master's coming. And in this parable, you have a master that's gone away and he's appointed a steward over his house, some trusted servant that's going to be in charge of looking after his household and making sure all of his servants are fed at the proper time and there, there, uh, some supervision of the house while he's gone. And, I mean, uh, who's some people we could make that apply to maybe in the local church? You know, so he's got a servant. He puts them in charge of overseeing the house. What would you think of? Elders? When it comes to the gospel, maybe the preacher, make sure he's on on alert, make sure everybody's getting fed the whole counsel of God. And so, I mean, there's a lot of application to be made there. Every Christian has a responsibility to others, right? We're all stewards, and it's uh, uh, required of stewards, first of all, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4.1, that a a steward be faithful. If you're going to put somebody in charge of your property and to look after it and your family, the first thing they've got to do is be faithful and loyal in doing their duty and being trustworthy. He calls them a sensible slave, someone that is uh, practically wise, prudent, uh, mindful of uh, their interest and what's best uh, for themselves and those they're overseeing. That's the kind of person that needs to be uh, represent all of us, right, in this parable. If we put ourselves in that parable, are you sensible? (laughs) about the way you're living your life, knowing the Lord's coming back and you're going to have to give account to Him when He comes, and how's, what's He going to find you doing when He comes? Is there, are you going to be loyally doing your duty? Are you faithful, trusty, uh, continually carrying out His commands? And some of the things we're supposed to do, just to have a small list there, we have a duty to love our brethren. That's a great uh, commandment that the Lord has given to us, that love them the way the Lord loved us. Uh, Have concern for the church. Paul had concern for all the churches, he said. And if Paul was concerned about the brethren, so should we be. They're a symbol on the first day of the week and when the church comes together so they can stimulate one another to love and good deeds. They're not just looking at yourself. You're, You're trying to make sure other people are built up. There's so many times, you know, when we're tired on the Lord's Day, uh, maybe on a Wednesday night, and 
oh, I'm just not feeling all that, you know, motivated for myself to be there. But you're supposed to be thinking about everybody else too. About if you're not here, then your presence will be missed, and it'll be a just a little bit of a discouragement when people are looking for you and you're not here. So you're you're looking out for others. Will the Lord find us so doing? Speaking edifying words to people instead of uh, unwholesome words. Eagerly waiting for the Lord is what we're told in Philippians 3.20. So uh, one writer said, not with nervousness or lukewarmness. You know, they kind of went out of their minds about the Lord's coming back at Thessalonica. <laughs> Some of them quit work because the Lord's coming. They got the idea he was coming back any time now. So we can just sort of put life on hold here in the world. Yes. Uh, yeah, sure, certainly there's a lot of reasons uh, because God said to be here. That's, that's a reason. It honors him. We want to worship him and praise him, but it also we want to help the brethren. <laughs> we want to help our other members that are here and think about them. That, that's what the Hebrew writer mentions, that uh, we all need to be encouraged. And it's always, you know, I never fail to be surprised at the different things people are going through that we don't know about, you know. That a kindly word and some encouragement and coming to worship really makes a difference in people's lives. That there was somebody there that cares about them. Um, so the slave, is the master going to find him so doing when he comes? And Of course, we need to put ourselves in that passage. Truly I say to you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. So following the parable, I mean, he's got a servant, he's trusted him with this important duty of looking after the household and its members while the master's away. He comes back and the man has done an excellent job. There's nobody losing any weight or meals. Or everything's put in order. He remembered his master was coming back. He didn't uh, waste his time. He did his duty. Well, well that should be us. <laughs> when the Lord comes back, he, he finds us so doing, trying to do our duty and be faithful and then he'll put us in charge of all his possessions. So you think about a wealthy landowner like they had back in those days. I mean, some maybe Roman that owned a big chunk of Palestine maybe or a big section of land, and he had other properties all over the world maybe that he also had, and he's got this faithful servant there in Judea. He can put him in charge of his estates in Rome or somewhere if he's faithful, right? And then you apply that to us. Here we have some small responsibility that we're doing here in this world, in the church, and in, in using our talents to try to help each other. What might the Lord put us in charge of in eternity? You know, something to, <laughs> something to think about, isn't it? We're going to be doing work when we get to heaven. There's things that we're going to be, we're not going to be sitting on a cloud playing a harp and just singing all the time. That That's... That's a picture you get, isn't it? But it talks about us doing service in heaven, that we've got things to do. We're, there's things that are important that are going to be going on in eternity. And it says, I'll put you in charge of all my possessions. So uh, it gives me the idea that's just really something to be motivated by in the life to come, is that we are going to be active and we're equipping ourselves for uh, a great life in the life to come. So... He's rewarded and we will be rewarded with glory and honor and satisfaction in the future, the Lord tells us when he comes back. And look at the moral influence that the Lord sets forth here. Just try to make a parallel between the servant uh, that really cares about his master and he's coming back. Uh, it's, you believe the Lord is going to come at any time. It, it, it's going to affect your behavior, isn't it, if you really do that? the way you carry out your job. If you think he's not going to show up for two or three months or whatever, you'd be much uh, less likely to, you know, look to your duties as you should. It'd be easy to procrastinate and put things off until you think it's getting closer to his arrival. And uh, so, wow, there's power in, in, in really believing the Lord could come at any moment. And uh, Keep the thought of the master near us, one writer said. It, it takes us out of ourselves. As we're thinking about the master, he's, he, he may be coming any day, any moment now. I better be busy about doing what i got to do. And it keeps you uh, busy about your work. It keeps you thinking about uh, pleasantly surprising the master when he comes in. He's going to be so pleased that you're uh, you know, living the life you should and taking care of people like you ought to. 
It's going to put a smile on the master's face when he comes because I'm going to be ready when he gets here. And it takes you out of a self-centered attitude and sentimentalism and it, this practical way of waiting for God is serving uh, others, being alert, busy at your work. It certainly elevates your work because you're waiting on the master to approve it. It's not just drudgery, but you're doing something you know the Lord's going to appreciate when he comes. Anybody else have a thought on this verse? There's a lot, lot of things you can apply there. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time, and begins to beat his fellow slaves and to eat and to drink with drunkards. <laughs> so here we have the, uh, the contrast. And it, all of this is being applied for disciples, right? <laughs> so it shows what can happen to any of us. We can become an evil slave where we're, we put the Lord out of our mind and, and we live our life every day like we're the only ones we're accountable to. <laughs> you know, whatever we want is what we're going to do. And uh, so the master's not going to show up for a long time, if ever. And we begin to just uh, selfishly use other people. Um, you, don't, you don't have to hurry up with your preparations and you got time enough to do whatever and you can be involved in self-indulgence. Uh, no fear of being taken unaware if you didn't read a... You think it's worthwhile for us to study this tonight? <laughs> and the Lord has several parables about it because people have a tendency to put spiritual things out of their mind because we live in a physical world, right? And uh, so uh, the, he says to himself, you notice that, my master, the slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time. And I, I oftentimes try to tell my children and tell myself uh, when they, you start talking negative things to yourself, <laughs> don't do that. It, it really matters what you think about yourself and what you say to yourself whether you can do something or whether you can change things or you can be successful, all, all of that matters what you talk to yourself about. If you, if you say to yourself, the Lord's coming back any time and i got to be ready, <laughs> that's one frame of mind, right, that you're preaching to yourself. But if you're saying to yourself, he's not coming back anytime soon, that is a very dangerous way to talk to yourself, that i got plenty of time uh, to do what I want. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he, it says in Proverbs 23, 7. That's what you really are, is what you say to yourself. So you want to transform yourself, you need to learn to talk to yourself in the right way. And the scribes were reasoning in their hearts. And the rich fool said to himself, I have many barn, you know, I have many crops. I'm going to build bigger barns, and I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. He had all these plans. The Lord said, you fool, this very night your soul's required of you. Now who's going to? have all these things that you think you're in control of. And the prodigal son, of course, he had a good saying to himself, didn't he? You know, it's better to be a hired servant at my father's house. I'm going to get up and go back to my father and say, I just want to be a hired servant in your house. I'm not worthy to be your son anymore, but I wouldn't be eating this pig food or, or longing for it if I was back home. <laughs> so we can say good or bad things to ourselves. Um, one writer said, the spirit of disaster is when you learn to say, there's plenty of time, right? That's what really gets you in trouble on anything almost when you say, I've got plenty of time to deal with that. And uh, the parable or the fable is told about a demon apprentice, sort of like the screw tape letters if you've ever read that, where the demon is trying to figure out how to seduce people for the devil. And uh, he says to the devil, I, well, I got a plan. I'll tell them there is no God. And Satan says, oh, there's too much evidence around everywhere that there is a God. So that you'll get a few, but you won't get everybody with that. Then he says, oh, well, I know. I'll tell them there is no hell. And the devil said, oh, there's, there's a hell right here on earth for sinners that, you know, that they're involved in. They know there's a lot of evil consequences for doing wrong things. That, that'll get a few, but it won't get all of them. He said, I'll tell them. <laughs> There's no hurry. He said, all right, go out and get them all. You know, you can destroy millions with that one. And that's really true, isn't it? You've got plenty of time. You can fix this next year, next week. Ten years from now, you can put God first. You've got to get yours now for a while. Plenty of time. So most dangerous day 
one writer said it's when you learned the word tomorrow. <laughs> and it's uh, manana, and that the other, other way to say that. <laughs> tomorrow, I'll deal with that. Uh, any other thoughts on verses 48 and 49 there? Here's some more thoughts. <laughs> Here's the fruits uh, that are given there in verse uh, 49 about the fruits of thinking the Lord is long delayed. You start, uh, the guy starts treating the servants that are under him. He begins to beat his fellow servants. It, does, it says he began to, which kind of almost implies it didn't last long before the Lord came back and fixed this, but he was abusing the Lord's servants or his master's servants for a period of time and uh, lording it over them. Just uh, One writer said he was striking with the fist of his office over these people. How many people get carried away with their authority and start, instead of the, their authority being something to serve serve the company or serve the church or serve others, uh, serve their family. It, it's all about selfishness. And uh, so it's a temptation any can fall into if they don't think the master's coming back. Uh, and they're cruel. And we can be cruel to our brethren in a lot of ways. Maybe say, well, I don't, I've never punched anybody in the church or I've never like physically abused anybody in the church. But that's the parable part. You know, try to apply that spiritually. How could you be abusing other people, right, other than uh, you don't encourage them? That, that's kind of a bad deal, isn't it, for children? If all they get is criticism and they never get encouragement, that's, that's bad. <laughs> if you treat your brethren that way, it'd be bad too, right? Every sermon is I'm, I, I just fire away and reprove and reprove and reprove with no exhortation or encouragement. <laughs> That's abusing people, isn't it? Uh, so failing to encourage, teaching a bunch of extra requirements about salvation. Not enough just to do the simple things the gospel tells you to do. You've got to do what Billy wants you to do, what my judgment is, right? And I start binding that on the church. That's abusing people. <laughs> there are a lot of ways to, you know, we all just have, maybe, uh, this is my little list here. you got a list. <laughs> Of ways you could abuse somebody with, because you're not thinking about the Lord and He's coming back and you're responsible, you put that out of your mind. You end up uh, judging and condemning people about matters of opinion that aren't a part of the Word of God, or you 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 behave yourself in such a way it causes other people to lust or to or be encouraged to sin in some way because of the way you're acting. All of that's abusing other people. Uh, he says carousing, the self-indulgence of eating and drinking with drunkards, feasting together, you know, is a sign of fellowship that you 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 approve and you you're associated with these people and so on, and you're out drinking with them and carousing with them. That that is uh, completely irresponsible when you're supposed to be doing your duty for the master. So. If you were thinking the Lord was going to show up any minute, you wouldn't want to get caught in that circumstance, right? <laughs> Anytime we do that kind of thing, uh, we're taking a chance the Lord's going to come, right? Or we're going to die right in the middle of it somewhere or another and go meet the Lord. Yeah, I guess you could do a whole other parable about a, a security system that's watching you <laughs> all the time, right? He's got you on the monitor, right? He might be in heaven, but he knows everything's going on, right, or whatever. Uh, so think of, the, think of the Lord. He might come quickly. And uh, if you think about that, it prevents you from doing all of these things. Remember in, in the wilderness when they were at Mount Sinai, they what happened to this Moses? He was gone for six weeks, 40 days on the mountain. And they say, I don't know what ever happened to this Moses. We, and they, they made him an idol, and they ate, drank, rose up to play, and started worshiping their idol and getting out of control. And then Moses showed up, didn't he? God sent him back down. And they were caught right in the middle of all of that when Moses showed up. So the Lord... That's a, uh, it's just a foretaste of what will happen when the Lord comes back. Uh, verses 50 and 51. The master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour which he does not know, and will cut him in pieces, and assign him a place with the hypocrites, 
in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the, the, the parable kind of goes from the physical illustration of what could happen to what the real spiritual thing that is going to happen with the Lord coming back, doesn't it? Kind of blends them together there at the end of the parable. The master's going to come, and here's this evil, abusive, self-indulgent person, and he's going to be punished severely when the master catches him unaware. So the warning is be kind to others. <laughs> Serve others. Keep yourself under control. Don't let your desires get out of hand. And he'll be cut to pieces. Now there's some commentators, I mean, they, they apply this literally. And there are examples in the Bible, aren't they, where somebody's chopped. <laughs> uh, you remember Agag, uh, after uh, you know Saul let him live, uh, Amalekite was brought back. Samuel the prophet took his sword and chopped him in half. That's what he did with him. And so there are Bible examples of that. Uh, I guess that could be a punishment. A master had life and death uh, control over a servant. He could chop him to pieces. Uh, Thayer says in his dictionary, he gives the literal meaning, but he says it's also used, and I think maybe better, the idea of cut up by scourging or scourge severely That is a way that that, that could be translated and taken. So he gets a severe punishment when the master shows up. But... Uh, He'll be assigned a place. He used to be a steward in charge over God's house and now, or the master's house, right, in the parable. But now he's given a place with the hypocrites, those that just play act like they're a servant of God that are going to be punished when this life is over. He gets thrown in with them because that's what he is, right? He was supposed to be a servant of God. And he'll be weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth, grinding of your teeth is gnashing your teeth. And, uh, I mean, how many times we see somebody suffering great pain and they give them a bullet to chew on in the Old West or whatever. <laughs> Grinds your teeth in pain. Something's happening. Put a stick in your mouth. Uh, same thing here. That's the picture of hell. And the disappointment and grief that will be there when you're cast out of God's service and, and uh, reward. Quite a dramatic picture. So the Lord uses the carrot in the stick right <laughs> if you do it right then you're going to be well pleasing to the lord and he's going to give you all of his possessions and what a wonderful day it'll be when the master comes back but if you're disloyal to the master look what happens any other thoughts on this parable i guess the lord didn't think that was enough because <laughs> he's going to give us another one all right it must be a hard thing to stay ready all the time I know it is for me. you got to pray about it and think about it and we worship together and be reminding each other all the time because sin is very deceitful and this world can just cloud out spiritual things in, in, from your mind if you're not vigilant. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. So here the beginning of chapter 25. So... Then at the time of the Lord's coming, this is what it's going to be like. So that's the context, right? Well, when the Lord comes back to get his bride, it's going to be like a wedding uh, feast. And you might be reminded that in the ancient times, you, you would get betrothed to a, a, a bridegroom, would get betrothed to a, another girl. They'd pay the, pay the dowry to the family, and they'd entered into a contract of betrothal. And then maybe a year later or after a period of time, then it would be time for the wedding feast. And at the wedding feast, the uh, groom would come to the bride's house. At, you know, it might be any time during the night <laughs> and get her. And they'd have a whole uh, group of attendees, these virgins that are talked about that are her friends. And they would go with the bridegroom with their lighted lamps through the streets and you can think about how dark the streets would be. We live, we don't, I mean, I've never been in a time where we didn't have electric lights or, you know, really good lighting. But it wasn't that long ago, there weren't any. You went outside at night, there weren't any lights out except the stars and the moon if it was out. And even just a, a lamp, burnt a little oil lamp that they would carry would be a big deal, I guess, to 
go through the streets. Everybody in the procession was to have a lamp as you went all the way to the groom's parents' house or his house. And then when you got there, all the people that were uh, guests would come in and you'd have this week-long marriage feast that would last. And then, uh, you know, a real judgment that Jeremiah and the prophets mention uh, when God judged Israel is there wouldn't be the sound of the bridegroom anymore and the, and, the, and the bride and all of the happiness and celebration that was connected with the marriage. <laughs> that was a really big event for a whole town of people, you know, when that happened. So that's the picture that's given here. The Lord's coming back from heaven. He's coming to get his bride, the church. And all of those of us that are uh, wanting to go to the marriage feast and be in the procession and get invited into the party and have an enjoyment of God's blessings in the life to come, we need to be ready to welcome the bridegroom when he comes because if we don't have our lamps ready, we can't go. <laughs> right? We're not getting in. They'll shut the door on us and we won't get in. That's the uh, idea of be, be ready, be, be prepared is what the, the whole uh, parable is about. And you can see an example of these ancient lamps, some of them even simpler than that where you have a wick uh, kind of floating in, in some oil that's inside there. And, of course, it didn't last all night. You needed to take an extra supply with you in case it was way late in the night when the bridegroom shows up. You need to be ready to refill your lamp. And you got to have enough faith, right, or, and enough perseverance to last all the way to the end, you know. Some of us, we get... You know, we get called maybe in, in youth somebody dies and they go to be with the Lord. <laughs> Other people live up into their 90s, 100 years old or whatever. And you, you got enough oil to get you all the way <laughs> to the end faithful or, or till the Lord comes. If it's, a, you know, many years in the future. So the picture is you got to have that uh, ready so that you can go in the procession. And five of them were foolish and five were prudent. And when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil and flask along with their lamps. So sort of a question of, I don't know, we all have a, I guess, a tendency a lot of times we're just going to do just enough, you know, to, just enough to get by right now. But you've got to have enough oil that's going to last all the way to the end is the picture, right? You've got to have enough to deal with the evil day, having to wait a long time maybe for things to turn around in your life where you're under temptation. So this Bible class, you think, well, I don't know how much good the, you know studying the Bible this week is going to do. We need to look at it as we're laying up some oil <laughs> for later that we may need when we really get in a scrape. You know, we really get in a situation where we need all of the faith we could muster to get through it. And that's what he's saying. You've got to have preparation if you're going to be ready for the Lord to come. So don't be careless. Be forward-looking. That's what Paul says about the putting on the armor, right? Put it all on so that you can stand <clears throat> when the evil day comes. And we never know when that's going to happen. I, I've got times in my life, and I know you've got times in your life, <laughs> we're just... Boom, 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 bad things happen and you're in difficult circumstances and your faith is tried. <laughs> and you need every Bible class you ever had, you need all the strength you can get to get through it and be faithful. And then there's other times it's pretty smooth sailing, right? So get, get prepared. That's what we're here for. Um, so have enough supply that will burn to the end. And uh, that's the first one. Uh, so... Matthew 5, 16, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Well, let's be wise and have enough good works and oil to, to burn all the way to the end. And verses 5 through 7, Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. So long delayed, they began to get drowsy and to nod, uh, these ten girls that are waiting. 
And I, I don't suppose there was anything wrong with that. It was a long night, but somebody was watching. There was going to be a signal <laughs> saying, he's here. And so they, as soon as they got the signal, though, they needed to get their uh, lamps taken care of and get it lit and get it ready to, to use it. And we're going to find out five of them had some oil and five didn't when that late hour came. So some of them were not prepared. Only five of them were ready when the signal was given that the master has come. And uh, we're told in the next parable, the parable of the talents, it says that the master went away for a long time and then he came back. So don't you think there's some implication that the Lord was going to be in heaven for a long time till he came back to the world? It's turned out that way. <laughs> In the first century, I'm sure there were some thinking he's coming in our generation. In the year 1,000, a lot of people really thought 1,000 years he's coming back. And now it's 2,000 years and probably the same kind of idea. You know, he's, okay, he's coming now. But it says he was long delayed. And we don't know when he's coming back. So the shout goes up. And the foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil for our oil, our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, saying, No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourself. Well, this isn't a good situation. It, there's not enough for everybody, and you brought your oil, right? And it's important to you to go to the wedding feast. You can't share your preparation with somebody else. You can't. That can't be passed on to anybody else. And uh, is it right for you to give up your seat, right, that you paid for? And <laughs> you've done the work, right? And now somebody's going to come in and say, hey, give me your seat. Give me your place on the flight or whatever. No, I, I, this is my seat. I, I did what I needed to prepare for this. And so go get your own oil. You have to go get it for yourself. And, and it's been pointed out that you can't transfer somebody else's oil. You know, I, my great-grandpa is really a faithful guy, and I'm going to – Use some of his <laughs> on the last day. Or I'm going to pray to one of the saints, you know, and the saints are going to give me some of theirs. Or, well, you, can't, you can't borrow preparation from somebody else and things you should have been doing to get your character right and your uh, works right. You've got to do that for yourself. And so uh, you, the, what dealer is going to be available at the, at the drop of a hat for them to go get their oil? It's just a, you know, it's part of the... Just the picture of the parable, I guess, but it's just like a hopeless situation that they're going to be able to go get their oil and get back and get to the place before the door gets shut on them, and that's what we're going to see. Um, and while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him and the we to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. So they're out trying to gather this that they needed to make preparation for <laughs> gathered at the last second. There's some things you can't do at the last second. That's certainly what it teaches, isn't it? You, when the Lord comes back, it, it's, your fate's sealed. What, are you either ready or you're not. That's the way it's going to be on that day. One will be taken and one will be left, right? That's what's going to happen. And so um, the bridegroom comes and wives get to go in and think of all the joy and security and peace and People here in this parable in the first century, they would picture all of this festivities and happiness that they are all getting to go to while you get shut outside in the dark and you don't get to go in. You're not even recognized is the picture that's given. So the second coming or death, uh, the door gets shut. Another writer said another area, if you continue in sin till you harden your heart, you're pretty well, the door shut then too, isn't it? Because you're not going to repent if you get that hard. So don't let the door get shut on you. That would be the message, wouldn't it? All right. We'll come back and look at the Jesus' application of the parable and the parable of the talents, uh, Lord willing. Is next, next week the, will be the first Wednesday, right? So we'll have singing next week.